We will get started with today's webinar in just a few minutes. We are waiting on a few more people to join. Please stand by. Good morning, everyone. We will get started with today's webinar in just a few minutes. Please stand by.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carrie Burke, your moderator for today's webinar, Clear AppSec Visibility with AppSpider and ThreadFix. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A chat feature. We will collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dan Cornell, a globally recognized application security expert who holds over 15 years of experience architecting, developing, and securing web-based software systems. As Chief Technology Officer and Principal at Denim Group, he leads a technology team to help Fortune 500 companies and government organizations integrate security throughout the development process. Presenting alongside Dan, we have Dan Kirkendall. Dan has been focused on application security and building application security software for more than 13 years as one of the founders, co-CEO, and CTO of NT Objectives. He has led the development of NTO Spider, which is now Rapid7's App Spider. Dan has been and will continue to be responsible for the strategic direction and development of App Spider products at Rapid7. All righty. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Dan, for uh, being with us here today. Absolutely. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. No, I'm excited to have you on talking about some of the stuff you've done, um, especially if you look at the dynamic application security testing or the DAF space in Gartner speak. Uh, I think you all have been doing some really interesting stuff looking at how you need to dynamically test applications, especially as the way that people build web apps has evolved. So I'm excited to, to, uh, to have you on here, uh, excited to have you, uh, uh, you know, to have an opportunity to hear you talk about some of the stuff that you all have been doing. Um, so, and thanks to everybody who's attending here today. Again, uh, today we're going to be talking about clear AppSec visibility with AppSpider and ThreadFix, looking at um, what AppSpider does on the dynamic testing side and how you can combine AppSpider with ThreadFix uh, to coordinate different activities that you have going on in your application security program. And again, the value of being able to combine and look at these activities is that you have a clear view across the entire program. Uh, for an agenda today, we'll talk just very briefly about some of the trends that we've seen in application security. Uh, Dan will go through and talk about Rapid7 App Spider, including some of the really cool stuff that they have been doing lately. Uh, I'll give an overview of the ThreadFix vulnerability resolution platform, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how organizations using ThreadFix can benefit from App Spider and how organizations using App Spider can benefit from ThreadFix. Uh, and as Carrie mentioned, um, you know, we've, uh, we'll be collecting questions along the way. You can use the Q&A feature to queue those up. Uh, and we'll be addressing those at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the discussion. So, just looking at the state of application security, this is an area that is evolving very rapidly. Uh, if you look at the uh, you know the type of software and systems that organizations are deploying, there's a lot of really uh, you know interesting things that organizations are doing. They get a lot of value out of their web applications, mobile applications, and so on. And as a result, the security of those applications, as the architectures, this technology change, the you know testing the security of those systems is a is, is always a moving target, and security always seems to be lagging behind, which makes things very exciting for those of us whose uh, job responsibility it is to ensure the security of those applications. And what we see in programs is there are a number of different techniques that have to be used if you want good coverage for your applications. Uh, you know, just because this is such an evolving space, there are new techniques for developing applications that are being deployed all the time, which means that the techniques for testing those applications have to evolve as well. And uh, one of the things that we also see is that organizations find a lot of vulnerabilities, but they need to spend some more time fixing what gets found. Um, and uh, again, what we'll be talking about here today is looking at how you can combine using Rapid 7's App Spider with Denim Group's ThreadFix uh, to help keep up in a world that is moving very quickly and showing no signs of slowing down. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn this over to Dan Kirkendall to talk a little bit about App Spider. Thanks, Dan. And that's a that was a pretty good summary of kind of where. Uh, the industry's at, and I'm not going to talk so much just about App Spider itself. I want to talk a little bit about um, how the market has been changing, you know, kind of where we come from and and how things have been progressing, uh, just to help people understand the the nature of the problem. Uh, you know, as the the topic is, you know, AppSec, you know, some clarity in your AppSec. This this understanding what's going on 
in how applications are developed and the development process and how they're deployed matters a lot. Uh, because with application security, and I'm going to talk specifically about dynamic scanning, uh, which is scanning a black box piece of software, uh, this is an interesting challenge because um, often people don't realize when, you know, normal network scanners, let's say, uh, like our very cool scanner at Rapid7 Nexpos, uh, they're focusing on checking for known vulns, known issues. They're looking for uh, things that people have published say, you know, this version of Apache on this version of Linux is vulnerable uh, to this attack. And so they kind of, you know, they, they start with knowledge of a vuln that's there, and then they just have to identify, is this the version that was vulnerable? You know, is this the version you're running and is it vulnerable? With dynamic scanning, we have to basically discover a completely unknown application all of the ins and outs of that application, all of the parameters that are available for attacking, and then do our own attacking. And it's essentially like finding our own zero days, right? We, we don't know, this is a completely unknown app. There are no known vulns on this application uh, as such in a, normal, in a normal application. These are all custom built. So we always start off with the premise that um, we can't attack what we can't see. If we don't know it's there, if we don't have comprehension of a part of the application, then we're not going to attack it. And so that's what kind of creates what we call known or uh, false negatives, right? There may be a vuln there, but we're not finding it. And it's simply because we didn't see that that area is even there to attack. Uh, and that's what ends up happening quite a lot. So you have to understand all of the stack of an application and how it's built. Uh, especially these days, things have really changed. There's a lot more layers to an application, right? There's still the classic HTML and JavaScript activity, you know, the basic, you know, standard client. But then now they've gotten more complex where you have these AJAX and single page applications and even mobile applications, uh, which are much more complex to do discovery on that client side because there's a lot more. I'm going to touch on that. Uh, behind them, there's these REST APIs and even authentication to those APIs can create challenges. So let's just, this is where we're at now. Let's just kind of back up and understand where we kind of came from. When we first started dealing with web applications, they were pretty straightforward. You know, there was an HTML, which was really kind of defined to uh, document how to present it in a web browser. Uh, it was like a tagging format, really. Uh, but that basic HTML was pretty easy to, to look at it, parse it, and find all the links and essentially crawl, you know, I'm putting air quotes here, crawl a, a web application. Uh, we would see forms on the page, um, and usually those would submit to somewhere, and so it's pretty easy to kind of parse out the form and its inputs, And but, you know, the, the applications were pretty flat. The format of the communication was also pretty well defined. When we look at an HTTP request, you know, you had your, you know, either a GET or a POST, and your URL that it was trying to get, for instance, and if there was parameters, it'd be question mark, and then a name equals parameter and name equals parameter, uh, you know, item equals shirt, color equals blue. Um, and those were those name and value pairs that were pretty standard, and if it was a get request, they were up in the URL. If it was a post, they were down below. But that format was pretty consistent. Every application used it. And when we first started looking at you know, vulnerabilities in web apps. And, you know, this goes all the way back to 98 when uh, Rainforest Puppy released his, his article in Frack Magazine where he was kind of talking about what he saw as SQL injection uh, or what we now know as SQL injection and uh, the ability to manipulate these attacks. And it was a pretty simple. You could take that name and value pair and just deliver an attack into the value and, and often it would work. And so we had you know, pretty easy time with SQL injection attacks and bypassing logins and things like that. Uh, but it was kind of predicated on this very simple uh, structure to, you know, and it was easy to do the attacks. So that's kind of where we came from. Things have gotten more complicated. Applications and doing just the simple discovery of crawling an application can be very difficult. There's a lot of little tricks and traps that happen, uh, you know, pages, have, you know, forms that have to be populated correctly, right? If I have an address field, you know, it's asking for my name and address, 
and I put a bunch of A's into every field, it's going to reject me on like an invalid zip code, right? So I have to look at the form and populate it correctly to get deeper. Uh, the application may have workflows like a shopping cart where you have to add an item to the cart, click checkout, give my shipping info, then my billing info, and then eventually uh, I will, you know, do it, you know, complete my order and get a, a confirmation. You have to go through that process. If I just start like attacking the billing page and I haven't set everything else up, I'm going to get rejected. So the scanner has to be able to handle these kind of things. Um, and then all of a sudden you start dealing with AJAX applications or single page applications and things get way more complicated because now this one page that you're looking at is manipulated, right? Pa applications are no longer just HTML based, right? There's a whole bunch of other uh, and mostly, bit, you know, JavaScript uh, driven functionality that takes place. So, you know, when we first dealt with JavaScript, it was initially pretty simple and was usually for things like, you know, menus or, you know, flashy things on a page. Um, and so those were difficult, but whatever, it got much more complex when all of a sudden this JavaScript is doing requests on the back end, right? When, you know, Google had their Google Suggest come out and as you type, it's going out and getting, uh, you know, sending what you're typing and then getting back suggestions of what you might be looking for, uh, kind of autocomplete. Well, all of a sudden now it's changing the nature of the page. The page is being manipulated on the fly, right? Uh, if you look at our web pages and how they've gotten more interesting, um, you know, that flat page is now a very dynamic page. If you look at Gmail today, instead of, you know, in the old days and the left on there is squirrel mail, if you remember that, uh, you know, you click on compose and you go to compose screen. It would change the URL and everything. And then you'd submit it and that would often submit to a different page and then that would redirect you maybe back to your inbox. Well, now if you're on Gmail and you click compose, a part of the page just comes into existence and you type in there and then you hit send and it, that thing like goes away and behind the scenes, that email got sent and you're just back at your inbox or whatever you were doing. And so all of a sudden this page is changing as you're looking at it. So it's not like you have URLs that you can crawl. All of a sudden the page itself is being manipulated. And it reminds me a lot of um, the maze from the Labyrinth movie. If you remember this movie, as she's going through this hedge maze, hedge maze it's changing and it's moving and, you know, they're, they're you know, Creatures are giggling and laughing because they're just trying to get her lost. And that's what can happen with a scanner if it doesn't understand, you know, what's going on. All of a sudden I click on an event and the page is different. And so how do you go back to the one that it was? How do you, how many generations of these DOM changes do you follow? There's a lot of complexity. And the scanner has to be able to deal with that, including all of the things that these, uh, these frameworks that are out there, these SPA frameworks, or uh, let's call them JavaScript frameworks, they're designed to make it very easy for the developer to do really cool and interesting things, um, create a very you know, rich user experience. So they're great in that aspect, but they add a ton of complexity. There's a lot that these things do, um, you know, like React, for instance, it creates a virtual DOM. So if, you know, if you're looking at a browser and it's document object model. It's kind of how it parses the HTML into something that JavaScript can interact with. This DOM is, is usually how we would look at things and we can query that DOM for all of the, the elements that have events like an on click event when, you know, for the submit button or, uh, you know, as you type and you hit enter, you have an on complete event, whatever. There's different events uh, for all of the elements on the page. You could just query the DOM and get those and then you can try triggering them and see what happens. Well, all of a sudden, like React has this virtual DOM and uh, and it actually just registers one thing with the real DOM and then it has its own little private uh, virtual DOM or shadow DOM, uh, which they built to make it easier for the developer. And and that's fine, but now you can't query the old one. You have to, if, you're, if you wanna support React properly, among other things, you have to look at the shadow DOM. And so you have to kind of do this with each of these different, you know, SPA frameworks. You have to understand what's interesting about them, what makes them difficult to do automated crawling and, and dive in and start supporting the nuances of each of these frameworks. 
So there's some interesting challenges. You know, scanning web applications has gotten, you know, geometrically more complex as these applications have got more complex. Uh, you know, behind the scenes, we don't, again, we're not just changing from one page to another. That one page is turning around, and the way it does this is through, it's turning around and making requests, you know, sending data, getting something back, and modifying itself. Most of that's powered by these things that we call REST APIs or RESTful APIs. Uh, there's a bunch of different names for them. But basically what's happening is the browser, through this asynchronous support of, of JavaScript, uh, can actually turn around and make these different requests. And that's a problem because you have to be able to track that. But let's say you do that, great. You can see the, you know, behind the scenes is making these additional requests. Well, they added one more layer of complexity. Because remember, I mentioned this format that we were dealing with before where it was pretty simple. You know, you had this name and value pair structure. Well, all of a sudden to support the richer data sets that they want to be able to send and receive, they started adding new formats, right? Initially, we started seeing things like XML being used, um, and it's, you know, either sending and, you know, sending and receiving, sometimes it could be a mix, it could be sending the old name and value pairs and getting XML or sending XML. It can go any number of ways, but, you know, also we hit, we have a, a XML, then there's JSON, uh, Google has their own Google Web Toolkit, you know, pipe delimited format. Uh, there was uh, Adobe at one point had done this AMF where it was like a binary uh, object transfer. It was transferring a binary object uh, back and forth. Uh, but now all of a sudden your scanner has to understand these new formats and be able to work within them, right? If you don't fully comprehend the format uh, and you don't understand that JSON is a really rich data structure, it has nested data formats, and, you know, I formatted it nicely here so you can kind of see that it's actually like XML and that it can support nested data, right? Each element can be, can have children. Uh, well, that's an interesting bit of complexity and you have to be able to parse that and understand it and then be able to attack within that. If you don't properly support this, what we've seen some tools do is they, they see it as just one string, one piece of, you know, one, one variable and, uh, and they'll add their attack at the very end. And then it's really doing nothing because the, if you know anything about JSON parsing, after the final squiggly bracket, it basically will ignore everything else in most cases, or the parser will just error, and you won't actually deliver your payload anywhere interesting. If you want to support these things and attack them, you have to be able to understand the nuances and understand, okay, I want to attack, uh, you know, this parameter name, and so you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to make sure it's being escaped properly within the format so that you're, you're really delivering your attacks where you intend to. Uh, and so it becomes very important that you support this as well, right? Um, there are some interesting problems with REST APIs and I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but one challenge is that, um, especially when the API is used for like a mobile app where it's, you know, it's the same, those REST APIs are being used for numerous things. You can use them for the back end to a, an AJAX or single page application, you know, web app. They can be used to back end a mobile app. Uh, they can be used just for direct business to business purposes. They're very powerful uh, and, and they're getting more and more popular. But one of the challenges is that uh, crawling them, there's no way to really crawl them to discover when these APIs were like, you know, when people thought of web services, they usually thought of SOAP, uh, which is a, a format that isn't used as much anymore. But one of the benefits that SOAP had is that it had this thing called a WSDL or WSDL that went along with it, which documented that API and would describe everything that was used. Well, there wasn't anything analogous initially for RESTful APIs, uh, and it's a much more free flowing in terms of format. It's not as strictly defined. So uh, these, these documentation projects or ways to document uh, came into existence, Swagger, API, Blueprint, RAML, they basically make it easy to document your API in a programmably usable format. So what that means is, uh, like in Swagger, it actually documents your API in JSON or YAML, uh, these textual formats, um, and then those can be used to, like, to create a PDF or a Word doc um, or an HTML page 
that is nice for presenting, right? Most of the time, these APIs were, if they were documented, they were documented in like a Word doc uh, that a, you know, a developer would have to sit and read and actually then build a client. Well, with Swagger, API Blueprint, and RAML, they can create those documents, but they can also create a client code. So I can say, oh, I want, you know, there's a little, here's this API. It'll create stub code in Java or whatever you're going to use, uh, and it makes it very easy to start using it. Well, we can actually consume those Swagger documents, and now all of a sudden we know all of the functions and parameters available, and we can actually attack it, right? So these things are very useful as we move forward, and we want to do more and more with RESTful APIs and automating the attacks. Uh, some of them we'll discover through crawling an AJAX app, but uh, it's certainly much more helpful if, you know, the APIs are documented in these formats, and then we can automate the attacking process. Um, finally, these web services also have their own authentication in many instances. Sometimes there's still the classic, you know, HTTP authentication or um, some custom header, session cookie, things like that. But we see other open standards like OAuth being used quite a lot, especially for APIs that are used by mobile apps. Um, some of them have their own custom code signing process. So if you want to test those APIs, you have to make sure your scanner, um, like ours, can actually handle all of these different things, including custom code sign or custom request signing. Um, and, you know, we have support for all these things. But there's a lot of layers now to the, the problem. And so we have to handle all of those, uh, including just the natural evolution of the attacks, right? And you can look at what's been going on over the years, and i got to add the newest uh, OWASP Top 10. But, you know, even the OWASP Top 10 has changed considerably over the years, right? You know, cross-site scripting was the fourth uh, most important issue in 2004, then became the most important in 2007, uh, and then dropped down a little bit in 2010 and, uh, and even further down in 2013. And I think it's even further down now because there's mitigation. So, uh, you know, the evolution and understanding of the different attacks and what matters and uh, all that continues to evolve as well. So this is actually kind of the easier part to keep up with for dynamic scanners. The stuff I mentioned before is the, the more difficult. Um, and then finally, the methodology of building applications and deploying applications has changed considerably. Right? Our whole development process, our software development life cycle, uh, has changed considerably. Uh, you know, we've gone, and this is just a very simple view, and we're going to kind of discuss it a little bit more as, as uh, Dan Cornell jumps back in. But, you know, we've moved from this old classic waterfall method where you would uh, collect requirements, uh, you know, from a customer, design it, implement it. Um, you'd finally get, you know, the customer verify it. And often there'd be a gap, you know, maybe of a year uh, between the initial requirement phase to actually delivering. And often the it didn't look anything like the customer expected or whatever. And, and then you're, you know, this big gap created lots and lots of problems. Uh, certainly, you know, lots of software got developed, but there was a lot of uh, unsatisfied customers in this process. And it was, a, it was kind of a mess. So we've moved over the years to this more agile model where we're, you know, doing these in much smaller phases, where we're developing earlier and more and more often. Uh, one of the the things, you know, back going back one is the, the the verification or testing phase was kind of intended to be more comprehensive then. Well, now with Agile, we kind of do this in small sprints in many instances, where we can kind of, you know, plan, design, build, test, uh, get it, you know, do review and and launch, and just kind of keep going through this in in very quick cycles, sometimes as many as, you know, uh, you know, every two weeks or something, it, you know, it just depends on the org. But this allows a lot more feedback. Um, one of the challenges is now people are, you know, it's like move, move, move. So you have to kind of be, if you want to be functional and provide security testing, you have to kind of fit within this continuous integration that has evolved where people have automated quite a lot, where, you know, a developer can, can write their code, uh, commit it to, you know, their subversion or GitHub server uh, service. And then maybe like there's a Jenkins uh, server, and that's a continuous integration tool, which will monitor the source code repository, see a change, uh, grab the code, you know, build it, push it into a test environment, maybe some, this little Selenium, the SE checkbox there, and some automated testing might happen. Uh, a good spot to add AppSpider would be right there where it's, you know, in a testing environment, 
you know, if there's any vulns or bugs, um, you know, we can find them and report them, you know, maybe send them into the JIRA, uh, whatever. We want to kind of fit that automated process is already happening without security, right? Development teams are doing that for their own convenience. This is great. But it's, a, it's also a great opportunity for us to plug in security testing. Um, and one of the things that I, I've been pushing a lot is kind of focusing on this whole concept is like, let's be part of what the development teams are already doing with or without us. And the more we just naturally, uh, you know, and seamlessly plug ourselves in, uh, we can create a much better, you know, opportunity for us to succeed and actually have the testing done. Um, and what we want to try to avoid, and this is where kind of the integration with ThreadFix becomes very interesting, is that one of the, the philosophies that I've been pushing is this idea that a bug is a bug is a bug, right? A security issue is just a bug that has security implications, but it's just a bug. It's a bug in the software. Um, and, you know, what, what has happened over the years is we tend to run a security uh, scan of some sort, and then we have this report, you know, a lot of times some products would give you like a 200 page PDF with all these issues. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you hand that off to the development team. This is not part of their process. This is not part of their, you know, very quick moving process. All of a sudden you've given them this 200 page report and, and they're supposed to do something with it. It, and, and often they get very defensive because, uh, you know, it's like a security issue and so it's important and maybe it's it, it feels like an indication that they're doing something wrong and it's a it's an issue well it's not it's just a bug and if we could just take the security vuln and we run this you know we run the scan of the automated process and we push it into their existing uh you know issue tracking or bug tracking system which is part of their sprints it's how they run everything if you just plug it in there and just treat it like any other bug then it becomes part of what they're doing and they can fix it. It's a, you know, they get a lot less defensive uh, and it just ends up working out a lot better uh, as, as part of their existing process. And, and, and there's a lot less pushback. So we like to do that. Uh, and that's a big push. And that's something that uh, ThreadFix is amazing. And we'll kind of discuss a little bit, but it's very good if we could do that. And then also understand that eventually this rolls into their full DevOps process where, um, you know, when you're looking at this, that little sprint that was going on, where it was like plan, code, you know, build, test, um, and and push, uh, that then gets handed off to an IT operations team, which has their own automated process to deploy it and and you know have it put it into operation and monitor it, uh, and then this kind of goes back and forth. Uh, the more we're just part of what's already happening. Uh, then you have a, a you know a much more successful program, uh, and at Rapid Seven we try to look at this across the board because you know certainly we have you know tools like App Spider that function within the DevOps or you know the development side of this, uh, but we also have products uh, to monitor the security of the operation side. So we try to look at the entire uh, problem. Today we're going to focus on the AppSec problem, but just so you're aware, Rapid Seven you know has all the operational security testing right with Nexpos and and the other tools that we have, the log entries and, and everything else. So we kind of play on it. We like to look at this entire problem set and understand development is, you know, the application used to kind of just be its own little thing. But in a lot of orgs, like this stuff happens in such an automated process that if you're not part of the whole thing, you're going to be missing out on, on something. So we like to kind of look at the whole thing. Uh, but kind of jumping back over to this thing, getting it into your issue tracking system, is something that we really appreciate about uh, ThreadFix for us is, you know, it, it can kind of consume our data and helps uh, go into many more issue tracking systems than we support. And, and so I'll hand it back to Dan here, but uh, that's our, our little discussion about AppSpider and kind of how we fit there. Uh, so Dan, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Dan. And I wanted to touch or kind of, kind of emphasize two points that you made that I thought were really fantastic. Um, you know, and, and the first is look at where you talk about you can't, you know, you, if, if there are things you don't know about or you can't test what you don't see. That's something at Venom Group with a lot of the organizations we consult with uh, looking at or helping them design their application security programs, 
we look at issues of coverage. We spend a lot of time looking at issues of coverage. And one aspect of that is coverage of the portfolio. Do you know all the applications that you have that you need to be doing testing uh, for those applications? What kind of testing? What's the frequency? That's one aspect of coverage. But another critical aspect of coverage that I think you guys, with, uh, with, with the things you've been doing with AppSpider, hit really well is when you do testing of the application, what's the level of security insight that you're getting? And that's something that I think is, has become increasingly challenging for organizations as web application development methodologies and tools and platforms and frameworks have evolved. Uh, a lot of the other tools haven't evolved with that, but that's something that I think you all do really well. Um, again, supporting AJAX, supporting single page applications, supporting REST, uh, supporting the dynamic testing of the web app or the, the REST services supporting mobile applications. Uh, you know, and dealing with those potential authentication issues, you know, providing, you know, by, by you guys providing that deeper type of testing, the ability to test the, these additional classes of applications that are becoming increasingly prevalent, uh, that it's tremendously valuable because if you take a lot of standard uh, testing tools and just point them at an application, you're not necessarily going to get uh, anything uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to be able to fully exercise the application and you're not going to see as much. And so, you know, thinking about application security from a coverage standpoint, when you look at the depth of inspection that you're doing, the stuff that you all are doing supporting these new technologies is tremendously valuable. Uh, I'd also say, uh, you know, you've a, a, a great point, and this is something that we'll touch on, uh, you know, kind of repeatedly over the next, uh, the next however often talking about thread fix, but I think you made a great point as well, which is, you know, as security folks, you're always going to be outnumbered by developers. You know, your best case scenario in most organizations is there's going to be a one to 100 ratio between application security folks and the software developers. So the developers are going to be able to write a whole lot more software than you're going to be able to test. Um, but to the degree that you can push a lot of these testing activities out to development teams, you know, kind of pushing that some, certain testing responsibilities out to the edges, uh, that certainly helps you. It gives you leverage as a as a security team and in, in, and in deploying those tools, getting those in the hands of developers, but also taking advantage of the tools that the development teams have put in place. Um, again, really, uh, you know, two two great points. Some stuff that we'll uh, that we'll touch on again. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much. All right. So now uh, we've talked a bit about Rapid7 App Spider. Now we're going to look at uh, ThreadFix. And the ThreadFix is a vulnerability resolution platform. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But basically what it's doing is it's collecting vulnerabilities, and we want to help you save time for your application security team and help them to get more vulnerabilities remediated faster. And in support of this, we allow you to do three major things. The first is to create a consolidated view of the applications in your portfolio and the vulnerabilities you've identified in those applications through a variety of testing activities. Then we want to help you prioritize application risk decisions based on data. We want to make it much easier than it may be right now for your application security teams, your application security managers, to determine what are the vulnerabilities that are most important for us to fix. You know, again, nobody has, uh, you know, nobody, nobody has the budget they want, uh, nobody has all the resources they feel like they need, and so you've got to make tough decisions in security. And so with ThreadFix, we try to make, we, we try to make making those decisions easier to, by providing you with the data you can use to prioritize. And then finally, and this touches on some of the things Dan said, we want to help you translate these vulnerabilities, which are what security teams care about, we want to help you transition those vulnerabilities over to the development teams or the DevOps teams in the tools they're already using. And I think that's a very critical point to make, which is these development teams outnumber you, but they have deployed a lot of technology and tools, and they've developed processes that help them deal with their workload. And so to the degree that you can take advantage of the tools they've deployed, and you can take advantage of the processes they already have in place, that helps you make security vulnerabilities into just more bugs that need to be resolved. And that's a, a critical inflection point that we see in a lot of application security programs. And we'll talk a little bit more about how ThreadFix helps you do that. 
So it's just kind of visually thinking of the workflow with ThreadFix on the left side of the equation, you have all the different testing activities that you might be doing. You know, if you're doing dynamic testing with Rapid7, AppSpider, if you're doing static testing with a check marks or a, or a Fortify or an IBM uh, AppScan source, um, we want to be, we want to allow you to feed those data streams into ThreadFix. In addition, you're probably also doing other activities. You're probably doing manual assessments, you know, manual penetration tests, manual code reviews, and you may have third parties that are also looking at your software and weighing in. Uh, you know, you know uh, external parties doing pen tests, and you may be doing component lifecycle management, uh, you know, with your open source components looking for known vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, so you want to load in all that data or you know, take those data feeds and consolidate those in ThreadFix, you can determine what are the most important vulnerabilities to fix. And as you do this, this gives you access to tremendous information from a reporting and analytics standpoint, so you can take a much more quantitative view of your application security program, and it lets you take those vulnerabilities that security teams care about and turn those into bugs that the software developers care about. So you can transition those into the defect trackers that the developers are using, or even the IDEs that the developers are using. And furthermore, by taking all of this application security data and massaging it, you can feed that up to the risk management folks and the GRC systems that they're using so that they can understand how application risk and how your application security program fits into the overall governance, risk, and compliance management program and processes in the organization. So looking at creating a consolidated view of applications and vulnerabilities. So ThreadFix lets you lay out your portfolio of applications. Again, in large organizations, you're probably geographically distributed. Maybe you've grown through acquisition. You've got teams all over the place that are all developing software. And so ThreadFix lets you lay out here are all the teams we have developing software. Here are the applications each team is responsible for. And let's collect the pertinent metadata about those applications so that we can start to make determinations later on. You know, which applications are subject to PCI compliance? Which applications have personally identifying information? Uh, which applications are written in Java? Which applications are mobile? <clears throat> you know, which applications are using REST interfaces? Uh, again, you can, you can collect all that information about your portfolio, and that, first of all, lets you understand the scope of the attack surface organization-wide that you need to address, but it also sets you up with the data that you're going to need to slice and dice later so that you can make those good risk management decisions. ThreadFix also allows you to import all the results of the testing and assurance activities you're doing. Talked about this a little bit before. Dynamic testing with AppSpider, static testing, check marks, Fortify, uh, you know, IBM AppScan source, uh, you know, white hat Veracode, you know, all those different services or products that you're using to test your software, as well as those other assurance activities, you know, third-party bug bounty reports, uh, you know, manual penetration testing, external reviews, you know, all of this stuff, it allows you to feed into one central repository. Because at the end of the day, you don't care if you found a SQL injection via dynamic testing or static testing, you just need to determine, hey, how serious is this? and where do I need to place this fix on my list of priorities. So ThreadFix lets you bring in the results of all your different testing activities. And from that, it consolidates those vulnerabilities. So it normalizes the data and dedupes them. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're doing testing with more than one dynamic scanner, more than one static scanner, ThreadFix normalizes that data and dedupes it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, and this is especially interesting, I think, to folks using AppSpider Dynamic. We can also, for certain languages and platforms, do what we call hybrid analysis mapping that allows you to correlate between static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. <clears throat> so this saves your security analyst the challenges, as Dan talked about, you know, of, hey, here's a 200-page PDF with a bunch of vulnerabilities. Well, instead, those vulnerabilities are data that are in the system, and as you load in additional results, ThreadFix can go through and identify situations, hey, here is a case where we have, where we've got two different findings from two different tools, but these actually both correlate to what we think is the same single underlying vulnerability. And that can be a huge time saver. That's one thing that we've found is, you know, even moderately sophisticated application security programs are typically using multiple technologies, multiple techniques. And this consolidation and correlation is a huge time saver to allow organizations to 
get their application security folks focused on high value activities as opposed to this low level data management. So once you've got your application portfolio laid out and you've started to load in the results of all these testing activities, then you've got to make some tough decisions. Again, as I mentioned before, I don't know anyone in the security space who feels like their team is overstaffed, right, or who feels like they have too much time in the day to address the issues that, uh, that, that, that have come up for them. And so you're going to have to make some tough decisions. You're never going to be able to fix everything, so you've got to make good decisions about how to bring to bear the resources that you do have. So with ThreadFix, because we have all these different data sources normalized and in the same place, you can start to slice and dice. And so you can look at the portfolio level to say, well, first, I want to look at all of our external facing activities. Or I know that the auditors are coming to talk to us about PCI or some other compliance requirements. We're going to prioritize those so that we've got a better story to tell them. But then you can also look at a particular application to determine for this application, what are the things that I need to address first? You know, if this has sensitive data, maybe first I need to address all the SQL injection because I have you know, serious confidentiality uh, con concerns if these vulnerabilities are allowed to persist. You know, if this is a public-facing application and there's cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, maybe I'm concerned about this being used as, a, as an avenue for phishing. You know, whatever it is, by having all this data in a structured format, you can go in and slice and dice the data in order to determine which are the vulnerabilities that I think are going to have the uh, you know, which are the ones that I need to fix in order to have the greatest impact on the risk that I'm exposed to. Also, with the 2.4 release of, of ThreadFix, which uh, was a couple months ago, uh, we're also doing some interesting stuff looking across the different development teams. So if you've got a static analysis program, we're looking across the different development teams to identify situations where your developers internal to your organization may be sharing code that has vulnerabilities. That can help you identify, hey, I need to find the team developing this component, get them to make a fix, and then to push that component downstream, because then if I get one vulnerability fixed, as, though, as that fix makes its way through the organization, I'm addressing 20 other vulnerabilities that I've identified. And by doing this all in one central location, that gives you access to a lot of really valuable data. I mentioned before, Again, you know, if you identify SQL injection via static analysis, via dynamic analysis, you know, you know, that's a, you know, from a fixed standpoint, it doesn't matter how you found it, you just need to get it fixed. But having all this data in one central place allows you to break across these silos of information. It puts you in a situation where you can answer an expanded set of questions from management. Because you can go in and say, hey, for all the testing that we've done, show me the vulnerabilities that are in applications subject to PCI, where those applications are external facing and where I did my testing on a production instance. And I want to know for the critical and high vulnerabilities that meet that criteria, which ones are over 30 days old, right? And so you know, maybe that's a, a case where you've got a policy and you've got to get exceptions for those or whatever it might be. Having all that data across your static program, your dynamic program, your open source management program, having all that data in one place allows you to quickly narrow in and, and, and focus in on these, uh, on answering those types of questions. And it also lets you benchmark how are we doing, doing versus other industry sources. For example, Veracode's State of Software Security Report or uh, you know, Whitehead has a comparable report that they published. So you can look and see, hey, the industry says that people are resolving vulnerabilities at this rate. We're resolving vulnerabilities at, uh, at whatever rate it is. <clears throat> that puts you in a situation where you can take a much more quantitative view of your program, and it also sets you up to have a much more grown-up set of conversations with management. Because you can say, here's how we compare to others. Here's how this technology is working versus this technology. We trained this team in secure coding, and it had this impact on their performance. You know, do we want to spend the money to extrapolate that program across the organization? Um, and so, again, having all this data in one central location puts you in a position to, have a, to do much more sophisticated analysis uh, and to make better decisions so that you can shepherd the limited resources that you have. So finally, on the other end of this, we want to translate these vulnerabilities, again, that security teams care about, and we want to turn those into software defects that developers care about. We want to take advantage of all of the infrastructure, all the tools, all the processes that the development teams have put in place so that we can drive those issues through to resolution by getting them into the developer's normal workflow. 
And you can do that in ThreadFix by bundling these vulnerabilities up and saying, hey, we're going to take these 10 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, I'm going to make that into one defect, and I'm going to send it to the JIRA system that this particular development team is using. And for this other application, I'm going to take 15 SQL injection vulnerabilities, or I'm going to take all the vulnerabilities in the checkout process, because those are all in one you know, similar part of the code. I'm going to bundle that up, and I'm going to send that to the HP Quality Center instance that that team uses to track their workloads. This allows you to set up the, uh, you know, the developers so that, they're the, so that the vulnerabilities you want them to fix are the same type of things that they're working on otherwise. You know, from a development standpoint, what am I going to do today? Am I fixing a bug? Am I fixing some vulnerabilities? Am I implementing a new feature? Again, your stuff lives alongside all the other things that they're doing. So looking at some particular cases where you can use ThreadFix and AppSpider together, or where, again, where ThreadFix is particularly valuable for folks using AppSpider, or where AppSpider is particularly valuable for folks using ThreadFix, you know, there's, a, there's a couple things. You know, one of the things, and I talked about this a little bit before, we've developed a technology we call hybrid analysis mapping. And this was, or the original funding for this was provided by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, you know, we did the R&D and we're commercializing it. And that allows us to correlate between dynamic application security testing results like you would find from an app spider and static application security testing results like you would find from a check marks or a fortify or an IBM app scan source. <clears throat> and so this allows you to provide developers with a great view of the information they need in order to fix the vulnerability because you can say here's the request that was sent to the application Here's the data or code or control flow path through the application that the, that the attack took, and here's the response that came out on the other end. You know, that's tremendously valuable to be able to stitch that stuff together in an automated manner because it lets you, number one, have more confidence in the results that you're seeing that they're not false positives, but again, also puts you in a position to characterize and arm the developers with the information they need to say, yes, I believe this is actually a vulnerability, I understand what's going on, and I know exactly where to go in the source code in order to address this stuff. Uh, in addition, ThreadFix, we, with ThreadFix, we have what we call our scan agent technology, and that lets you centrally from ThreadFix schedule and run AppSpider scans, and so you can coordinate that with other testing activities. If you're doing AppSpider testing, if you're doing, uh, you know, again, static testing with some other tools, uh, you can coordinate that centrally from inside of ThreadFix. So that lets you get more, take more advantage of the testing capabilities of Rapid7 AppSpider and hopefully deploy that uh, against more applications in your portfolio and allow you to do that in a much more you know, time efficient manner. Uh, now we'll open things up for questions. Um, looking through the chat room yeah, and so, the Q&A. Yeah, Dan, I'll, I'll jump in yeah, on uh, one of these. Uh, there's a couple questions here. One of them is um, about how is AppSpider feeding data into ThreadFix? Uh, this person had a chance to use the manual export of AppSpider and uh, there's an XML that can get consumed. Uh, so two things on that. Uh, first one is, and I was just talking with, with uh, Dan Cornell about this, is we are going to start getting everything switched over to this uh, the XML that we have had for a long time is actually kind of summary data. It's not complete. So uh, we're trying to get everything moved over to this, uh, the new uh, JSON output that we have, which is a, a actual complete uh, representation of all the vuln data that we have. Uh, about each phone. And so that uh, we should be getting ThreadFix uh, updated to that at some point. Um, we have had some, like we have a Jenkins plugin that uh, puts that XML and, and the JSON file into the uh, Jenkins sandbox, which then can get picked up by ThreadFix. Um, or the uh, what you were mentioning earlier with the uh, scan agent. Does the scan agent actually automatically pick up the XML? Do you know? Uh, yeah. So the way the scan agent works is it runs the desktop version of uh, AppSpider and collects the results and sends it up into ThreadFix. Uh, and so that works. That's a way to automate it for folks that are using the desktop version. And as you said, we're the, the, what we're transitioning to, and then we see this with a lot of the tool sets that we're using, uh, we're going to be transitioning to pulling data from AppScan, or, uh, sorry, AppSpider, uh, the, the enterprise via the API. Uh, and, and that's the goal where you can set up, again, you, you set up like, hey, here's what the AppSpider application is called, uh, you know, here's what it's called in ThreadFix, 
you know, let's set up whatever testing schedule, either via the enterprise console or via ThreadFix, and then that scan just happens and the data gets pulled over. And so right now, as they identified, you can upload the manual results, um, which is, uh, you know, fun to do the first two times you do it, but uh, again, most organizations <laughs> like more automation, and that's something with ThreadFix, philosophically, we want to support automation that's in place and open up new opportunities for automation. Uh, the scan agent right now will orchestrate scans via the, um, via the, uh, uh, or for the desktop, and the direction that we're moving with that is to pull via the App Spider Enterprise API. All right, and then there's another question here about uh, the licensing of ThreadFix and and which features of the paid version versus the open source version is needed or useful for the uh, App Spider ThreadFix integration. All right, yeah, great question. And so the there, there's a community edition of ThreadFix. That right now is like that code base, our focus has been very much on the enterprise edition for the last probably year and a half. And so that there's a little bit of bit rot in that code base, um, but that's basically at the 2.3 release. Um, some features that are in enterprise that aren't in community as of that release are in enterprise authentication models, so the ability to have, like in the community edition, everyone is essentially a root user where they can see everything and do everything. And also the more advanced technologies like the scan agent, like our hotspot, uh, are, uh, are not available in the community edition. Uh, we're working on a deal to get some funding to do some updates to the community edition. It won't be necessarily adding a lot of new features, but just to do some maintenance on those. Um, that, the, that, that deal is working at a uh, we'll just characterize the pace as it's slow, uh, but right now the, the vast majority of the ongoing development is all in the, in, in, in the enterprise edition. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see another uh, question here. Oh, about the uh, oh, and about the licensing model. Um, oh, yeah, and the, and the licensing model for the enterprise edition is on a per application being managed, uh, you know, being managed basis. Okay. Okay, another question and here. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, and then uh, as far as the continuous integration, you know, if you're plugging into that, uh, you know, we have. Right now, a Jenkins plugin and a, uh, a halfway functional uh, Bamboo plugin. Uh, which ones do you guys support currently? Uh, do, do, which do we support? Uh, so which right continuous now, integration? Do you have plugins yeah. for different uh, CI tools? Yeah, yeah, and so right now, as of the 2.4 release, the we have a Jenkins plugin that will basically take the results of any testing that you're doing uh, and scoop those up and send them into the ThreadFix server. With the 2.5 release that's coming out in about uh, three or four weeks, I think it's supposed to be released now, um, the, the Jenkins, or you know, we've actually you know, greatly increased the capabilities where you can you know, basically you know, orchestrate a variety of different tools from inside of ThreadFix, or inside of the ThreadFix plugin, where the plugin can say, hey, I want to run a, uh, I want to run a full scan with App Spider. I want to run a differential scan with check marks. I want to wait for the results of those and pass or fail the build based on this stuff that comes out of it. Um, and most of the logic for that is, is, is run or is handled on the server side. And so I think our initial support is Bamboo. And then shortly after that, I think we have slated that we're, I'm sorry, the initial support is for Jenkins. Uh, and I believe the, the next two after that are, uh, that, that we're looking to support are Bamboo and uh, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, and, you know, MS Build um, stuff. Awesome. All right, well, I think we're running out of time here. Yeah, we're just about to the top of the hour. Any last minute questions from folks? Well, very good. Well, I want to thank uh, all the attendees uh, who who logged in today. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to us talk about the things we've been working on. Uh, really appreciate uh, the folks asking questions. Uh, Dan, I also want to express thanks to you for coming on today. As I said, I'm, I'm really excited about the stuff that you guys have been doing, um, you know, extending dynamic application security testing to you know, all the modern frameworks that are flummoxing a lot of the other folks out there. So uh, it's, it's always cool to see the, uh, you know, how those capabilities have evolved. Appreciate you taking some time to talk about it today. Absolutely. Likewise, we like all the work that's going on with ThreadFix and and, uh, and just the continued relationship that we get to have is you know between ourselves and, and our company. So it's a lot of fun.
Very good. Well, again, thanks everybody for attending. We'll be getting a recording of this posted probably in the next day or so, and uh, we'll get an email sent out with links to that recording uh, for you to either review or to send along to any colleagues who couldn't make it today. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out, and we will uh, uh, look forward to talking in the future.